I'm Tom Morello, and you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, Steve. And the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to revisit Boeing's blighted 737 MAX. It's been one year since the FAA recertified the MAX. The MAX, of course, needed to be recertified after two of the planes were essentially hijacked by a software system called MCAS that took control from the pilots and crashed the planes. So is the MAX safe to fly now? Boeing and the airlines and the FAA say, absolutely. They say, hey, we fixed the sensors, and this time we're not going to keep it a secret from the pilots that the MCAS software system actually exists. After all, the only problems with the MAX were the MCAS system and the untrained pilots. They contend that the recertification process was the most comprehensive in history. They say, sure, you might notice some malfunctions on some 737 MAXs, but that happens with every plane. Don't get hysterical. So does the data back them up? Our first guest today, former Boeing manager and current Boeing whistleblower, Ed Pearson says, absolutely not. He's published a new report, Boeing 737 MAX, How Is It Really Going?, that uses FAA data to paint a troubling picture of current problems with the Boeing 737 MAX that includes reports of 43 malfunctions and failures aboard the planes, including six flights where U.S. pilots declared emergencies. He outlines how these things happen because Boeing prioritizes profit and production speed over quality control and safety. After that, we'll welcome friend of the show and international law expert Bruce Fine for a segment we're calling the Bruce Fine News Brief. Today, Bruce will help us connect the dots between the current conflict in Ukraine, U.S. state secrets, America's 10-year-long unconstitutional war in Laos, the 80 million tons of unexploded munitions we left behind there, and Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. As always, somewhere in the middle, we'll check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, let's hear from the Boeing manager, who, despite all the assurances from the powers that be, says that he will not let his family fly on the 737 MAX. David? Ed Pearson is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and Navy Flight School and served in the Navy for 30 years. Mr. Pearson worked for Boeing from 2008 to 2018. He was a production manager in the 737 program, and in 2019, he testified before Congress as a whistleblower. Throughout his career, he has served as a volunteer and chair of safety committees. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Ed Pearson. Well, hello, and thank you very much for inviting me to join you today. Well, we're very pleased to have you. I remember that you testified in detail before the House Transportation Committee on December 11, 2019, pointing out one issue after another that the Boeing Company and FAA have neglected to address relating to the 737 MAXs, which are up in the air again, over 200 of them, and which are now under an accelerated production at the Renton plant where you were one of the managers in the state of Washington. In your testimony before the House Transportation Committee, it was in December of 2019. And just to get the time scale, the Indonesian crash of the 737 MAX was in late October 2018. The Ethiopian crash was just a few months later of the 737 MAX on March 10th, 2019, 346 people died in those two crashes, and one Indonesian diver died trying to retrieve parts of the crash plane in the Java Sea. In between that, you retired from Boeing. What date did you retire from Boeing? I retired in the beginning of August of 2018. All right. So you had been very troubled about the production lapses, the accelerated pace, the fatigue of the workers, neglecting various internal reports. And so you take us right back to the plant where these 737 MAXs were manufactured, where the mass of the media attention and congressional attention, the FAA attention, 
after these crashes focused on the planes and on the software system. So let's go back to where the planes were produced and address the concerns that you had. Right. Well, back then in 2018, when those planes were being produced, I actually spoke with the general manager a couple of times and, and wrote them. And my concerns were that there was widespread issues going on in the factory. All those problems that you described, Ralph, with the backlog of unfinished airplanes, really horrific supply chain issues. We had shortage of skilled staff. Workers were being asked to work ridiculously long hours. All of our metrics, our health metrics in the factory were at record low points and trending in the wrong direction. And, you know, there was just a lot of evidence of warning flags. I mean, all the information was there to say that the factory was dangerously unstable. And we had, as an airplane is built, there's situations where if there's a problem with the airplane, there's a write-up that is written, and then there's supposed to be a team of people helping to fix it. Well, things were going so fast that people were losing track of stuff. And there was legally required functional testing that was required to be performed and and it was being done in a haphazard manner. It was certainly not being done in accordance with the production plan that was approved by the FAA. So all those concerns, and this is what I brought to Congress, is that it was, you know, a lot more concerns than just the software. Obviously, the software has gained all the attention because it was covered up and the pilot training was also not there. But my point all along has been that there's evidence of production quality issues, and that's been my concern since day one. And I've always felt that way. And in my reports, I showed that production, in fact, did play a role in these accidents or these crashes. Well, you have a remarkable record of putting out reports and letters. You have first written letters right after you retired to Boeing officials all the way up to the CEO, Mullenberg, and then you wrote to the board of directors, which was headed at that time by Calhoun, who's now the CEO of Boeing, and not getting adequate response After you went up the chain of command as a retiree, you went to the FAA, you went to the National Transportation Safety Board, you communicated with Congressional Committee, and they had you testify in December of 2019. So you've touched all the bases, and you've written three reports on the MAX crashes, their investigation, recertification, and current incidents. Now, most people don't know, and, you know, they're flying the 737 MAX in the U.S. and around the world. What they don't know is that there are other problems that were not publicized. And, of course, you went into the production deficiency problems and the electrical circuit problems. But there's also the generic problem of aerodynamic instability, because in order to rush the 737 MAX to production to cope with the Airbus competitor, they had to mount larger engines on an old fuselage design, and that created a potential stall problem, which Boeing recognized and tried to deal with a software called the MCAS system. So let's back up here and start with the aerodynamic problem, because the engines on the 737 are exactly the same size and exactly the same manufacturer as on the Airbus. But the Airbus had a different kind of fuselage, and they didn't have the mismatch. So weren't you concerned about the aerodynamic issue to begin with before we get into the substance of your reports? You know, Ralph, I really can't. I'm not really qualified to speak about the aerodynamic issues associated with the plane. I think that's been really well discussed by a lot of people, a lot smarter than me on the aerospace. You bring up a great point that I just want to mention here, if I could, is, and that is that just like the MCAS system was not shared with the pilots and the customers, inside the factory, we had no specialized testing. I never heard the word MCAS mentioned. So when we did testing of the flight control system in the factory, we checked the control surfaces and we have electrical checks and continuity checks and things like that. Not once did I ever hear anybody ever mention the word MCAS. And so it wasn't just that you know our customers and the pilots were not aware of it. Our own people apparently were not aware of it. Again, it was never, ever mentioned. So I just want to make a point of that. This was really astounding, the way all these groups you wrote to. Some of them were polite and responded. Others didn't respond. The government, the Congress, Boeing. It was a very frustrating time for you because you really laid out the facts from your experience. And it was a time when most people were 
not paying attention because the 737 Maxes were grounded. Well, they've been ungrounded for over a year, and there's a, a hotline that NASA has developed to receive pilot concerns as they fly these planes up and down and to protect the pilot's identity so the pilot is encouraged to further report these defects. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about the NASA data and whether it receives similar complaints from pilots on foreign airlines or is it just U.S. airlines? Yeah, the NASA system is called the Aviation Safety Reporting System. And as you mentioned, Ralph, it's actually an anonymous system. So it's designed to encourage reporting. And in terms of, I actually haven't seen any reports from any other countries in the system, but it always makes you wonder if pilot feels like they have to anonymously report something that is safety related. You know, that, that always makes you wonder like what's going on in that organization that causes that pilot. Because of course the airlines are telling us the airplanes are perfectly safe. Boeing is saying the plane is safe. And so for pilots to not use the legally required reporting system, which is the FAA's service difficulty reporting system. That's under Title 14. It requires U.S. aircraft certificate holders to submit these reports if certain systems are affected in an airplane. And it's very concerning when, you know, you have a bunch of U.S. pilots feeling that they have to anonymously submit reports. One of them just came out just two days ago. The NASA system is unfortunately about three months behind. It lags three months behind. And there was a report that came out yesterday the incident actually occurred in December of 2021, so several months ago, and it was scarily similar to the accident flights. I mean, the pilots are fumbling around for checklists. These are U.S. pilots that went through recent training. They were getting indications on, the, on their flight control system that was you know, showing instrumentation failures and confusion instrumentation. They struggled to find the checklist. They actually had controllability issues. And actually, the, the first officer reported that he was just thankful that they had such a short distance to go because it actually occurred on approach. And this is not an isolated situation, but this situation, and if you would like, I can kind of just give you a quick overview of what I found in the data. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Listeners, these are the defects, deficiencies, close calls involving the flying 737 MAXs since they were ungrounded by the FAA over a year ago. So we're talking recent events here affecting the deficiencies of the 737 MAX. Go ahead. First of all, I never even heard of the service difficulty reporting system. It sounds like some sort of customer complaint system. And, and I actually just got wind of it talking with a member of Congress. And then I found it and I looked into the system and I was quite surprised to see reports in there about the MAX since the plane has been ungrounded, as you said. And I looked at that system and then I looked at the anonymous reporting system, that NASA system, and I combined them together. And there's, you know, over 40 reports of in-flight malfunctions that occurred on max airplanes since the plane has been ungrounded and put back in service in the U.S. In fact, those 40 plus reports actually occurred in about a 10 month period of time because the max was grounded again in April for a, about a month and a half. So the reports of 42, you know, people always ask, well, you know, is that statistically relevant? And, you know, how does that compare to other planes? And I just want to kind of put some color commentary around it. And first of all, there's no real way to compare these. And this is not apples to apples comparison. There's been no other plane in modern history that's had two fatal crashes on brand new planes within a couple of months apart. Certainly none that have had a 20 month, you know, almost two year recertification as, and as you mentioned, as the administrator Dixon said, was the most comprehensive, most scrutinized transport airplane in history. So when you look at this and you think, okay, how does this match up? Those 42, 40 plus incidents occurred on approximately 170 airplanes or 25%. So in the U.S., when I did this report, which was the end of the year, this past year, 2021, I looked at it and, you know, those reports reflect 25% of the airplanes. So put a different way is 25% of the airplanes in the U.S. alone have already had to make a legally reportable report on an in-flight malfunction. I didn't even look at the stuff on the ground. I just wanted to look at the stuff in the air, but the stuff on the ground wasn't necessarily pretty either. And what's really disturbing about those reports is that more than half of them had to do with the flight control system. And as you know, the flight control system was the primary focus of the entire recertification effort. And as Steve mentioned in the beginning, on six of those flights, U.S. pilots declared emergencies. I don't know about you, but I haven't heard a peep out of this from any reporter, anybody in the news about this. And I've looked at the data. Actually, I looked at the data just the other night. And, 
you know, even since I've written my report, there's been at least three or four other incidents that have occurred. These are just U.S. pilots reporting, not foreign pilots around the world. Yes, that's right. In fact, at the time, there was a little more than 300 airplanes operating outside the U.S. And if you just take the same rate, the 25% rate, and you apply it to the 300, that's another 80 incidents. And so you add those 80 to the 40 in the U.S., that's 120. In other words, there's a malfunction, an in-flight malfunction occurring on average every three days across the globe. And that's assuming that you know they have the same rate that we have in the U.S. You can make the case that they probably had a more significant rate because they're so far away from the United States and from tech support, et cetera. So the fact that people don't know about this is just astonishing to me. And, and this information, you know, I've, I've really racked my brain. Like, how come I'm having to push this information out there? You know, the FAA should be doing this. This is their job. When the pilots declare an emergency, how bad is it? What does that mean? You say that six of these flights, U.S. pilots declared emergencies. When they declare emergency, they need to get special handling from air traffic control. It's basically telling air traffic control and everybody else on the radios, hey, you know, we need you to get out of our way and we need immediate assistance right now. I mean, there's a, a serious emergency occurring. On some of these flights, by the way, I'm glad you brought that up, Ralph. On some of these flights, it happened so quickly, like right after takeoff, they had to immediately turn around and land. They didn't even have time to declare an emergency. And again, this is just in the U.S. Overseas, there's commercial reporting systems out there, like the aviation record, I think it's called. There's a couple commercial systems out there that you can go and you can see there's evidence of foreign pilots having difficulties as well. So this is very concerning. Of course, the FAA administrator, before he ungrounded the planes, he kind of caveated, I said this in my report, he kind of caveated everything and said, you know, even though this is the most heavily scrutinized and I'm going to fly my family on it and all that, what he, he, he said was, you know, this doesn't mean that, you know, there's not going to be an occasion when there's going to be a situation where a max airplane is going to have to return to base or, or divert, you know, those things kind of happen. He certainly made it sound like it was a relatively rare event, certainly not 42 in the first year. And I have to ask you and your listeners, you know, if this is acceptable in the first year, what are we going to accept when the airplane's five years old, 10 years old, 15 plus years old, right? I mean, at what point does the aviation authority say, okay, that's enough. We're going to step in. I challenge people to read those reports. And I think they'll see that these pilots are dealing with issues that they shouldn't have to deal with. And none of them have to do with MCAS software. That's my whole point. Well, I have a flurry of questions provoked by your statements. And listeners, we'll tell you how to get Ed Pearson's reports later in the program. Number one, these pilots declaring emergencies and others, aren't the unions upset here? They rose up and criticized the Boeing company after the 737 MAX crashes. Are the pilot unions taking up the cause of the pilots here? Ralph, I actually think that that's a great question, but I think my short answer is I think that a lot of them are not aware of this themselves. I mean, again, this information, you have to go looking for this information. You just, this, I don't think these pilots are getting this information as part of their daily briefings. And, you know, it's certainly not coming out from Boeing or the FAA. And so they have to go look for it in these obscure government databases. Now, isn't the NASA database available to the public? Both of these databases are available to the public. The NASA database, as crazy as it sounds, even after two fatal crashes and all this attention and on the max, they don't even have a pull down selection on their NASA system for the 737 max airplanes. It's not even available. So you have to, this is one of the reasons it took me such a long time to crack the code on this because you need to put it in a special query, like, you know, percent sign 737 space, you know, just crazy query that you have to put in to get the results out of that system. Do you, on your website, do you inform people how to pursue that trail so they can look at the anonymous pilot reports to NASA? Yes. On my homepage, there's a copy of the report. There's also a copy of the spreadsheet that went along with the report. And in the spreadsheet, there's the search query instructions with the link to these government sites. All right. We've been talking with Ed Pearson, who was one of the managers at the Renton plant that manufactured the 737 Maxes. He's been reporting as a volunteer retiree of Boeing again and again. He's put out three reports. Ed, give them a way that they can access your materials. And if you don't catch it on this round, listeners will repeat it for the end of the program. Yeah, it's all on the website. It's edpearson.com. It's pretty straightforward. That's P-I-E-R-S-O-N, edpearson.com. Now, a lot of people don't know that after the FAA ungrounded the 737 MAX fleet. 
about five months later, that is last year, Boeing suddenly recommended to the FAA that these planes be grounded. Now, why did they do that? Ralph, this is an incredible turn of events. I mean, it's, it was stunning. You know, after all this attention, after all this time, after all this recertification and all the promises of thoroughness and, and transparency and everything else, the FAA received a message from a phone call from Boeing in April of 2021 and said, hey, you need to, you know, we're, we're telling you we need to ground these planes again. And of course, they caught the FAA off guard, like, you know, why? And Boeing said that it was because it was production-related electrical bonding and grounding issue. And over the course of a month or two, they struggled to get the scope of this thing. It grew from just being a one standby power unit behind the first officer seat to the overhead panel and also the main instrument panel on the flight station. So this electrical problem that CEO Calhoun completely downplayed at the financial call, I dialed in on the, the financial call occurred right around that time frame, and he was asked about it and he he really downplayed this. He made it sound like it was a small, very small problem and, a, and it was something that was going to be handled quickly. And again, they didn't even have an idea how to fix it. It took a month before they got it you know, planned. But my point in this was, this was by no means the first time that there was electrical problems with this airplane. The records, the production records, and, and even in my testimony and the other reports that I had written, I pointed out that these planes had electrical issues and there was electrical installation and test issues, serious electrical installation and test issues in the factory when these and other planes were being built. And so for them to not have caught this, it really just kind of underscores the fragility, that's a word that somebody said that I thought was accurate, of the FAA's recertification. I mean, how could they have missed something like this? Which really kind of angers me, and I feel like this is an ongoing concealment of the truth, is that these problems pre-existed the building of both planes. And there's plenty of evidence in records that these kinds of issues were happening and people were having difficulty with our electrical system. We had individuals, first of all, you had a shortage of people that were qualified to do electrical work. And when we got backlogged in the factory, these individuals were stretched out, working ridiculous hours. Many of them didn't have adequate supervision and they're fatigued and, and fatigued people make mistakes. I know this from my military experience in, in aviation. So it is just stunning. It was a stunning turnaround. It, it should have been like, top news. I don't know what else was going on at the time, but to, just to imagine the Boeing and supposedly what happened is a plane rolled out of the factory and they had difficulty starting the plane. But that's a pretty bad problem, right? Plane coming out of the factory and you can't start it. And so this was a really scary event. And again, we had issues in the factory. I remember issues where people were reporting issues with electrical testing, bonding and grounding issues, et cetera. And, and these issues, and as I mentioned in my January 21 report, both airplanes, both the ET-302 and, and the JT-610 airplanes had electrical problems. And it was buried deep in these reports. But my report, I, I referenced the page and, and paragraph. And I've always felt, and I, I showed it in this report, that these defects occurred and people don't know about it. They just, all they hear about is MCAS and pilot training. Well, they're going to know about it pretty soon. I think the media has got to do another round here because you point out that the emphasis was on the software, the MCAS, but that was triggered in the wrong way by a sensor on the Boeing 737 MAX that gave a wrong signal, what they call the angle of attack sensor, giving the wrong signal to the software which led to a string of events and the crashes. And that sensor relates to the electrical problems that you pointed out. Isn't that correct? Right. The angle of attack sensor provides information to the, basically to the flight control system, the autopilot and the other systems. And that sensor is dependent on stable electrical power. And there's lots of electronics here too. You know, you've done work with electronics, you know how easy, if you have electrical issues, how they can fry electronics and there's circuits that can be damaged, et cetera. As an example, and I don't want to get into too deep, you can read my report, but in the case of the Lion airplane, you know, much has been said because if you pay close attention, you'll hear people, they will say that the plane, the day before the crash, they replace the sensor out, right? Again, this is a two month old plane. So why is a two month old plane, first question, why is a two month old plane having all these problems in the weeks before their crash, before its crash? It shouldn't happen, it's a brand new plane. But they decided to remove this sensor and they replaced it with a refurbished sensor. 
And then the next flight, they almost crashed. And then on the next flight, they did crash. This is the Indonesian That's airline. right. This listed. is Lion Air, right. And they never recovered those sensors that were embedded in the seafloor, I imagine, destroyed. But right. they still had that right. sensor that was the original Boeing-installed sensor that they had removed. Let's ask some obvious questions probably occurring to our listeners. You really went through the chain of command. I mean, you're reflecting your military experience. You went to officials and managers at the Boeing company. Then you went up to CEO. Then you went to board of directors. Then you went to the FAA. Then you went to the Congress. Two questions. Why didn't you go to the media faster? And the second is, why didn't you go to Flyers Rights, headed by Paul Hudson, who lost his daughter in the Pan Am crash over 30 years ago in Scotland and would have, I think, been very receptive at an earlier time to your disclosures. Do you just felt that you had to go through official sources? No, I I actually, Ralph, my my driving factor was I tried to, I wanted to do it as, as, as fast as possible. And I first went to the Boeing leadership. As you mentioned, I went to the CEO. I had several communications with the general counsel of the company and I communicated with the board of directors. And of course they never responded. So my thought was, look, I know that there's production problems in the factory. I just finished working there. And I know that those planes were pumping out 50 plus a month. And so I was trying to get Boeing leadership to act. I mean, I was pleading with them and I offered to fly to Chicago. I offered to you know, help them any way I could to go out and investigate the factory, to involve the international investigators so they could see right away. And that was ignored. And so then I went to the next fastest source I thought would be the NTSB because they were leading the investigation. So I tried to get the NTSB to go out and investigate. And it took me three or four months just constantly communicating with them, getting my attorneys to write them. And at the same time, I'm like, okay, now I got to talk to the FAA. So I started talking to the FAA. I'm trying to get them because here's what I'm thinking is I could go to a reporter. I could go to a reporter and have them do something. But as soon as I do that, they're going to deny everything. Everything's going to be denied like they have been denying. And then it's I'm stuck. And so I wanted to do the channels through the people that are responsible for this. I mean, the people that have the authority and the resources and they could turn around and say, stop. And that was my urgency, you know, and in hindsight, I probably should have done both. I probably should have tried to do it in a parallel manner, but I was urgently trying to get them to act. And when, uh, after the second crash, of course, I continued to do that. And that's when I decided, that's when Congress contacted me because they had heard I'd been doing my best to try to get them to do their people to do their jobs. In the summer of last year, after the sweetheart settlement by the Justice Department just before Trump left office in January of 2021 with Boeing, you went to the FBI in Chicago in the summer of last year. Did you not? That's right. I did. Actually, I went to, well, let me back up and explain what happened without going into some very specifics, but I was communicating with a former colleague of mine who worked at Boeing, worked with me in the factory. And this individual shared information with me that was incredibly disturbing. And what he told me, I immediately knew hadn't come out in the public. And I also sounded to me like a deliberate concealment and and a withholding of information, a cover-up. And so I immediately contacted the authorities. I contacted Congress. I contacted the Department of Justice. I I wrote to Attorney General Merrick Garland a couple of times. I tried to call. You can't get a hold of anybody, you know, in the federal government, it seems like, tried to go that route. I went to the FBI App Center. They, they contacted me into Seattle, then eventually to Chicago. And when I talked to the Chicago office, I finally, an agent called me and I said, look, I, I've got a lot of information here I need to share with you. And, and I can I tell you that this is important information, that this, this involves the safety of these airplanes. This is on August 3rd, this summer, right? And I explained to the individual, I gave him my background, you know, because I didn't want him to think I was just some crazy person calling off the street. And I provided him this information. He said he was going to talk to his colleagues because they had been involved in the criminal investigation of the company. And he went back and I didn't hear anything back from him. A a week or two went by. I called him again and say, what's going on? He said, hey, I've taken this information. We're dividing it and conquer. We're, We're going to divide it amongst our agencies here and we're going to pursue this and look into it. And I told him, I said, look, if for some reason you guys decide not to investigate this, which I said is unbelievable if you don't, but if for some reason some decision that FBI decides not to investigate, please let me know. And I'm, I'm going to go public with this information because this is urgent safety information the public needs to hear. And so I got, kind of got promised that, yeah, we'll certainly let you know if that happens. Well, it went 
another couple of weeks. And then I get contacted by another Boeing employee who worked as a senior mechanic in the factory. And this individual provided, you know, some details. He was an individual who, who worked very closely and every day with these aircraft systems and stuff. And he described testing and things like that that were not being done or not being done properly, et cetera. And these are federal aviation regulated type testing. And so I contacted the FBI again to share it, to contact. And, and both these individuals were cooperating witnesses. They both were willing to talk to the FBI and the Department of Justice and the Department of Transportation Inspector General's office and Congress. But you know what? FBI never contacted them. Neither did the Department of Justice or Department of Transportation well, Inspector General's. Well, to bring the listeners up to date, there's something really murky going on in the Biden Justice Department on this Boeing 737 situation because the families of the victims filed a intervention under federal law. Victims are allowed to file intervention when the Justice Department is engaged in criminal proceedings. And this is very recent. And they asked, in effect, to reopen the investigation. And Merrick Garland was on the phone with the families, and he listened to it and was very polite. And then in a short time afterwards, the Justice Department announced that they were rejecting the petition by the families, and there may be an appeal from that. So here we go from the Trump Justice Department to the Biden Justice Department. There's something very, very murky going on there. And if the FBI is sending the information that you and others have given them up to the line of command, Merrick Garland's got to be asked about this by the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the House Judiciary Committee, and there ought to be an investigation. There are civil lawsuits by the families against Boeing, of course, underway, but it's the criminal lawsuits. It's the criminal indictments and lawsuits that Boeing is really afraid of because they can always pay out to the families and it's insurable and deductible and it's just a business expense. What they're really worried about is being prosecuted and sent to jail. And the Justice Department is extremely secretive here. They don't explain their decisions at all. And it's important that people like you continue to persist and try to get another round of congressional investigation. Before I turn this over to Stephen and David, let me ask you what is on the minds of all the listeners. Would you ever fly the 737 MAX, you and your family? No, I, I have no intentions of flying the MAX, and I've told my family and friends that. And this pains me to say this, Ralph, because I actually want Boeing to be successful. I'm proud to have worked for such a great company. And most of the people I work with were just amazing employees and worked. they did everything they could to do the right job. And it's just when you get individual leaders in key positions that have their priorities out of whack, it just it pollutes the whole organization. And so that's where I have great issue. I, I want the company to be successful. Yeah. But right now, I believe the airplane is unsafe. I'm confident in saying that based on my personal experience and the data that we're seeing now in the service of the airplane. The next question is, give the listeners an idea how many of these planes are up in the air now, how many are contracted to be built, and are they all going to have the same problem? Well, there's there's, uh, um, ballparking, there's over 500 airplanes out there in the world. Right now, there's a couple hundred they still haven't gotten rid of that they're they're going to try to sell, and they're producing airplanes. And what's really scary is Reuters just announced the other day that the company is planning to double production by the end of 2023. How many orders do they have on hand? Oh, they have thousands. I don't know how the exact numbers. This is another way, listeners, of saying you're going to have problems avoiding the 737 MAX. There are going to be so many of them, unless, of course, heaven forbid, there's another crash and they ground them. But advise our listeners, if they're in LAX or they're in Newark or they're in Miami and they're flying to another destination, what's the best way for them to avoid flying a 737 MAX, can they ask the airline or the reservation beforehand? Yeah, this, so they don't... My daughter asked this question two days ago, Ralph. If the airline that you're flying lists the plane that you're flying, if it says 737-8 or 737-9, those are MAX airplanes. A lot of people get confused because the bigger numbers people assume are the newer plane, like the 737-800 or the 737-700. Those are actually the older version of what we call the next generation plane. But the MAX airplane designation is 737-8 or 737-9. And they should ask if it's not on their ticket, if they haven't 
purchase their ticket, they can call and talk to a customer service rep and ask the question. And, you know, unfortunately, you can get to the airport and all of a sudden you get your gate switched and you don't even know it. And they swap planes out. I mean, so there's sometimes you can't even you don't even know that you're, you you could have been booked on well, one plane and then moved to another. So I think you a, can ask the person what equipment before you go on. You can ask the person behind the right. desk there. Are they dropping the name Max? I don't know. I, I haven't heard many people mention it, the word Max in the airports. You know, I've had family fly in and out, but I haven't heard that. But, you know, I think, Ralph, I got to step back here for a second because there's a part of the U.S. government that is completely absent in this thing, and that's the Department of Transportation. The Department of Transportation oversees the FAA, and Secretary Buttigieg has been completely off on the sidelines this whole time. He's apparently, I don't know the gentleman, obviously, I've heard very nice things about him, but in this regard, he's been absolutely standing on the sidelines. He's not involved. He's not demanding the FAA answer these questions. All the questions that the families have been fighting for, it's actually insane when you think that the families who lost loved ones that are grieving are the ones that are trying to get these changes and they're pushing the hardest to get these changes. And they're reminding the FAA, hey, these malfunction reports are important. You need to act upon these things. You need to look into them. You need to investigate them. You need to be decisive. And so here you have the people that lost the most doing the most to try to help and help all of us, you know? And so I think that the listeners need to put pressure on the Department of Transportation leader because he could turn to the FAA administrator. I realize Administrator Dixon just resigned and they're waiting to get another one, but he could turn to that new FAA person or, or the existing person who's leading the organization and say, look, I want answers. I want to know why these planes are having problems. I want to know what you're doing about it. I want to know why you haven't grounded them again. I want to know why you haven't demanded the investigation of these electrical issues and other issues that are associated with the plane that are showing up that are clearly production quality related. We need to get that arm of the government to do their job. And, you know, I think he feels like it's, it's almost seems like he, he doesn't want to get involved because he doesn't want to get muddied by it. But that's his job. That's his job. And we have listeners who are extraordinarily active when they're confronted with that kind of opportunity to contact the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. And you know how to reach the Department of Transportation listeners in an internet age. I've actually wrote to him myself a couple times and emailed to his special advisor. Never got a response, ever. Well, as for his chief of staff, she comes from New York. She was a leader in pedestrian safety. And she is the point person on the 737 MAX relations with the families. So if you, if you want to call the Department of Transportation, Ask for Chief of Staff to Secretary Pete Buttigieg. Unfortunately, we're out of time. It's edpearson.com, P-I-E-R-S-O-N, and it's Pete Buttigieg, Secretary of Transportation, who has political ambitions, keeping quieter than he should in the unfolding tragic history of the 737 MAX which is up in the air at the present time. It's often called the 737-8 and the 737-9. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you, Ralph. And uh, thank you guys for inviting me to join you today. We've been speaking with Ed Pearson. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, the Bruce Fine News Brief. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Report of Morning Minute for Friday, March 11, 2022. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Dozens of beef jerky brands were recalled in New Jersey and seven other states due to listeria contamination. That's according to a report in the New York Post. At least 70 types of meaty snacks made by Boyd Specialties in California and shipped around the country were yanked from the shelves after tests found they were likely contaminated, the Food and Drug Administration said. Health officials urge people to toss any dried beef made on fe February 23 due to the bacteria, which can cause fever, stomach problems, and convulsions, and poses an increased threat to pregnant women, unborn children, and the elderly. The brands in question include Bacon Mama Jama, Durban Farms Meat, Goldmine Jerky, and Jerked Out. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. Let's connect some dots with our friend Bruce Fine. David? Bruce Fine is a constitutional scholar and international law expert. Mr. Fine was Associate Deputy Attorney General under Ronald Reagan, and he is the author of Constitutional Peril, 
the life and death struggle for our constitution and democracy and American empire before the fall. Welcome back, Bruce Fine. Thank you for inviting me back. Welcome back, Bruce. Let's go right into three areas that you were concerned about, breakdown of international constitutional and federal law. The first one is Joe Biden talking constantly about Article 5 of NATO, that an, an attack on one inch of NATO country territory means an attack on all NATO members, which is a cause of war. And what you're saying, no, no, Joe, you can't make that decision. Who can? It's up to Congress under the Constitution, indeed under the NATO treaty itself. Mr. Biden wrongly cites Article 5 of the treaty, but Article 5 states that it'll be the constitutional processes of the respective signatories of the NATO treaty to decide how to respond to an attack on one of the members. And under our constitutional processes, it's only Congress that can take us into war. That's not only what Dean Acheson testified to, then Secretary of State, when Article 5 was before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee before ratification, but Congress in the UN Participation Act of 1945 explicitly described the constitutional process of the United States in this context as meaning the president must come to Congress for a joint resolution or act in order to use the United States military force offensively. So Mr. Biden, and he's been echoed by his Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, recently in NATO countries, is clearly wrong. He stated that he would respond with the full force of all the military arms the United States possesses, which I think is a subtext for saying he's not ruling out nuclear weapons. And what makes this very, very worrisome, I say a little bit like Sarajevo before World War I, is that we are already in discussions with Poland to supply Ukraine with MiG-29 jets. And if that happens, that makes Poland a co-belligerent with Ukraine. And Mr. Putin has already threatened that he would attack a country that was systematically providing arms to Ukraine. And Poland is a neighbor of Russia. It could well be the next Sarajevo flashpoint that could trigger then Mr. Biden's response in defiance of the Constitution. It is only and Congress you, you, that can take us from peace to war. Yeah, the NATO treaty is subordinated to the U.S. Constitution, which accords only Congress having the right to declare war. You point out that Joe Biden, in 2008, when he was running, I guess, for president, he was on the Chris Matthews show, and he said repeatedly that if George W. Bush invaded Iran without a congressional declaration of war— he would immediately urge the House to commence impeachment proceedings against George W. Bush. Yeah. So under his own definition, he's threatening to commit an impeachable high crime and misdemeanor. All this is described, listeners, in a letter to President Biden by Bruce Fine, Lou Fisher, and me. It'll be on the website, nader.org. Bruce, there were two mistakes, I think, you have to do. One is, it was Article 11 that did that, not Article 5, correct? They work in tandem. Article 11 yes. just says we implement, we implement all the provisions according to the constitutional processes. Okay, so you so, don't have to change that to Article I, I 11? I don't think I have to. No, no. Okay. The other one is, you said, supply MiG planes. MiG, MiG-29s. Yeah. Those are Russian. Right now, the idea is, Ralph, that the, the Poles would take their stockpile of MiGs that I guess they had left over when the Soviet Union collapsed, right. and we would replace them with F-15s, and then Poland will give them to Ukraine. That's the general idea of a swap. I think we re did we reject them today? That's what I read. But well, it's still in. I, we may ultimately not go for it. We're clearly flirting with the idea. And in some sense— I thought it was the S-22 they were going to give. To the, Ukraine? The, the, to the, the Poles? The I don't think the Poles have— It's a MiG-29. Okay. You're sure of that, okay? I'm positive. Okay. I'll learn not to question Bruce and making mistakes. <laughs> <Okay>. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right. All right. The next one. Ralph, let me just add the reason why it makes a difference. Some could say, well, what does it matter? Biden makes the choice or the Congress makes the choice. The fact is that historically, we know over 234 years that Congress is like to be far more thorough and cautious about finding an existential threat. 
and sending our men and women to risk that last full measure of devotion than the executive branch is. They've done it only five times in 234 years, and only in cases we are, in fact, actually attacked like Pearl Harbor, or whether the president deceived Congress into thinking we were attacked like in the Spanish-American War or the Mexican-American War. And Congress is a more deliberative body. It thinks more carefully about war because there's nothing in it for Congress. It doesn't aggrandize power for itself. It doesn't get monuments built after it for voting for war. It has to raise taxes. All those kinds of incentives to go to war are with the executive branch, which is why the founding fathers decided, no, only Congress is going to decide that very, very most significant decision a nation can make. And the deliberations are more likely to be public than they are in the White House. Yes, exactly. All the dissent in the White House, we know, is completely suppressed. Uh, Just read the Pentagon Papers and even the discussions we know leading up to the Iraq War. All those who forecast exactly what was going to happen, silenced. All right. The next issue you want to talk about is it's called the state secrets argument by the federal government. When citizens sue the federal government for illegal activity involving issues of war and foreign relations, the federal government doesn't want to go into open federal court. And what do they do? Well, Ralph, a little bit of background here. The state secrets privilege is nowhere mentioned in the Constitution. Indeed, we didn't even have a state secrets case in the U.S. Supreme Court until 1875. That's like 85 years after the Constitution was ratified. And moreover, it concerned really a breach of contract. An informant you know, made a deal with President Lincoln to spy on the Confederate States. And part of that contract said he was going to keep that information confidential. And then he sues and says, well, I want to breach the confidentiality. And the court, in a very summary opinion, it's really only a page and a half, says, wait a minute, you already promised to keep it confidential. You can't sue for your, your money. It's not an alarming decision. If the government doesn't pay their informants, they're soon not going to have any informants because they're not going to be working for free. So it's not nothing all that serious. The next case comes like over 70 years later. The next case in state secrets in called Reynolds versus the United States. It's 1953. And it speaks volumes that at this particular time, Ralph, it came at contemporaneous with President Eisenhower's Doolittle Report which recommended that the United States could no longer follow civilized rules in conducting itself against an enemy, the Soviet Union, that was ruthlessly and implacably seeking world domination. So things that were formerly unthinkable now became thinkable. And in the Reynolds case itself, the court takes judicial notice of the fact we're in an arms race with the Soviet Union. We really have to keep all of our secrets very, very confidential in order to survive against a, you know, a, a worldwide threat. And so the court makes up a state secrets privilege and says, well, the Secretary of Air Force can say that if we investigated an accident of one of their aircraft, it might expose secret military spy equipment. And therefore, without even looking behind the Secretary's affidavit that said this could happen, it said the estates of people who were killed in the crash couldn't sue the government for negligence in operating the aircraft that resulted in killing their spouses. It's a very, very terrible decision. And it wasn't even based on the Constitution. It's just kind of invented. We kind of feel nervous in 1953. And of course, later on, Ralph, this accident report that was allegedly sensitive, according to the Secretary of Air Force in his affidavit, was shown to show nothing more than that was riskless, that there was negligence in the operation and design of the aircraft that caused the crash. And when it went on the internet, there was no security information whatsoever. But anyway, since 1953, the state secrets privilege has just burgeoned. It has blossomed to cover all sorts of things, including concealing government rules for assassinations, kidnappings, torture, all these kinds of things that conceal government crimes. And the U.S. Supreme Court and lower courts have held even situations where what's being sought is the principles, the standards that were utilized to select people for what we call extrajudicial killings, uh, or drone by drones, is all classified. And so the victim or the families of those who are killed by assassinations have no redress in federal courts. So they go into federal court to try to hold the government responsible or accountable. The Justice Department lawyers come in and say to the judge, sorry, we can't participate because of state secrets. And so the judge has to dismiss the case. And the federal government escapes accountability to our third branch of government, 
which involves the federal courts. Is that a way to put it? That is exactly right. And instead, my view has always been, Ralph, that if the government believes that the secret is so important, they have to conceal it and prevent someone getting redressed. They ought to have to face up to the liability. Say, okay, you got to choose. Either you got to pay the damages you caused or disclose and we have a trial. But you can't have both ways. You can't have concealment and then says the damages you cause, you're immune from redressing. That makes no sense at all. It's not fair to saddle one person whose family is someone who's kidnapped or tortured or assassinated. You got to bear all the loss because the government wants to conceal a secret that helps everybody. You know, that's a classic example of a taking without just compensation. But the system is really, really out of whack. In this particular case that was decided and by written opinion by Justice Stephen Breyer, they say, well, to disclose the venue of a torture of Zabeda, who was one of the early uh, al-Qaeda detainees after 9-11, you know, would disclose a state secret, even though it has been recognized in numerous publications, foreign officials have stated the same. And the argument was facially, I think, facetious. It was stated by the CIA director. Well, if we officially confirm what everybody knows, then we will not get the cooperation of foreign intelligence agencies in the future because we breached a promise. Well, listen, these foreign intelligence agencies, they cooperate with the United States because we give them intelligence. It's not out of philanthropy or charity. They do it because it's good for them. They're not going to stop cooperating because we, just, we say, okay, now we're disclosing and confirming what everybody knows. It shows how naive these judges are in believing there's really any national security issue at hand here. But the more important point, I think, Ralph, is it really indicates how much we've degenerated into lawlessness at the highest levels. It's one thing to say, okay, the government can welch on its contract to pay an informant. We're talking about affirmative government assassinations, the worst crimes of all, extrajudicial killings and torture, which are universal crimes against mankind, and you can conceal them by just saying state secrets privilege. In a companion case where the FBI had targeted Muslims out in Southern California for spying because it was said they might be terrorists. They were so wrongheaded that these suspects turned in the informant to the FBI and said, we think this guy is going to be a terrorist because he's trying to entrap them. And nonetheless, they sue and claim you picked us out just because of our religion. And that's clearly would be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. It goes back to a very old case you remember, Ralph, in law school, Yick Wo v. Hopkins, where they selected all the Chinese laundries in San Francisco to shut down because they didn't have proper fire precaution. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, sorry, you cannot get access because it's a state secret as to how the FBI targets people for counterterrorism activity. Again, leaving the plaintiffs in the lurch. Well, then how else are we going to prove the motivation since that's the element that you need in order to establish an equal protection violation. But it's an egregious decision. And what makes it even more alarming, Ralph, is these decisions are written with virtually no dissent. There was Judge Gorsuch and Sotomayor. You got two dissenters in one case. In the other case, there weren't any dissenters at all, the companion cases. But you say, wow, <laughs> this is, covers the waterfront, all bought in to this total empire mentality that the government commit crimes in order to hopefully diminish risk you know, to the people, but the crimes are the greater risk than anything that they're trying to prevent. Tell our listeners something that they may not know about. What did we do in Laos yeah. next to well, Vietnam, in yes, the Vietnam it, War? Yeah. Well, Laos is another example of how, you know, we use double standards. During a 10-year secret war in Laos from 1963 to 1973, an unconstitutional war never declared by Congress. The United States dropped 260 million bombs on a country of 2.3 million, or 120 bombs per person. It's something that the United States has never redressed. Still today, 80 million of those 260 million bombs are unexploded, and they are maiming children and women and fathers in the hundreds per year. Since the end of the war, 50,000 have died from unexploded ordnance. And unfortunately, the United States has never made amends for these gross war crimes. And those are clearly efforts, I think, under international law, it's a war crime when you, you use military power that's vastly greater than the importance of the military objective. And the military objective in 
in Laos was it was a peppercorn at you know at best. So when we commit these war crimes, and we really never had a thorough hearing that is, in my judgment, should be required to account for how dastardly we acted in Laos. You know, we give the standard for others to emulate. And unfortunately, it is an earmark of international law that is very cynical. I may recall Curtis LeMay. Uh, he was the head of our Air Force in the Asian theater in World War II. He was supervising the firebombing of Tokyo, which killed more than actually Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And he openly acknowledged saying that we better win the war because if we lose, we'll be tried and convicted as war criminals. So yeah, victor's justice. It's very unfortunate. And that's what we're seeing. Well, it's important to put the situation in Ukraine, tragic and disastrous as it is, in a broader framework, because when we do these things and get away with it, there are dictators around the world who say, well, we can do the same thing and we can get away with it. Thank you very much, Bruce Fine. Thank you. I want to thank our guests again, Boeing whistleblower Ed Pearson and Bruce Fine. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. A transcript of the show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. And the American Museum of Tort Law has gone virtual. Go to tortmuseum.org to explore the exhibits, take a virtual tour, and learn about iconic tort cases from history. And be sure to check out their latest program on how litigation on brain trauma is changing the future of football. All that and more at tortmuseum.org. Ralph wants you to join the Congress Club. For more information, go to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website, and in the top right margin, click on the button labeled Congress Club. We've also added a button right below that with specific instructions about what to include in your letters to Congress. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. In two weeks, March 30th, we're going to do another live Zoom program with guest Jesse Singer, author of the book, There Are No Accidents. Go to RalphNaderRadioHour.com to sign up and be part of the show. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Good news. The postal reform legislation is about to clear Congress and go to Joe Biden for his signature. Helps relieve some of the unfair pressures on the Postal Service and starts the process of expanding postal services in your community. So the work our Congress Club members might have done here is just another example that change comes from the people. Hi, this is Jimmy Leewert, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up. First, we continue our conversation with former Boeing manager Ed Pearson. Let's get quick questions or comments from Steve and David. Yeah, Ed, I wanted to ask, you know, we've had a number of whistleblowers on the show in various industries. I just wanted to ask personally, how have you been treated since you've sort of come out of the closet and how have you been treated by former colleagues, the industry in general, the FAA? Well, let's just put it this way. I'm, I'm a very fortunate person. I wanted to continue working for Boeing, so I left my career five years early. I actually thought I was going to be fired when I brought this up. It was a hell of a way to end a career. But I left Boeing because I just couldn't, I couldn't be a part of this. And when Boeing, before my testimony, Boeing went out with a press release. They got wind of my testimony. And they, they basically said that my concerns about production were completely unfounded. In fact, in the recent Corey, Rory Kennedy documentary, at the end of the documentary, you'll see they have a statement about the fact that no government authorities have indicated that production played any role in these crashes. I would refer people back to my reports, and they, I think they could see for themselves that production did play a role. And the evidence of the airplanes right now that are having widespread problems, you know, Boeing will tell you... And, you know, that this airplane flying millions of miles and hundreds of thousands of departures, and they like to use these big, big statistics. But when you whittle it down and say, let's just talk about this 170 planes in the U.S. that are max airplanes, 25% of them have had a problem in, in flight. And you've had several of these have been very serious. And that's acceptable, you know. And so I feel like the, the public needs to be educated about it. And, you know, the stuff that's happened to me, and there's been some stuff I don't really want to go into. You know, it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing I know, so...
Okay, well, that's good. Uh, we're running out of time. You have put out three reports on the MAX crashes, investigation, recertification, current incidents. The first one was January 2021, second May 2021, third January 2022, and they are on the edpearson.com website for you to peruse. People who are listening who have technical backgrounds, avionics backgrounds, engineering backgrounds would be particularly interested in his detailed documentation. Listeners should also know that Ed protested when he was working with Boeing. I mean, he protested before the two crashes and was essentially ignored. So it isn't a situation where he only protested after he left the company. David, quickly, please. Thank you. You sat in on Boeing's financial call. So if you own stock in Southwest and they're flying the MAX, can shareholders push back at the airlines? That's a great question. I know some people have contacted me. I, I've been contacted quite a bit and I encourage you know, anybody who wants to reach out because I'm, I'm certainly open for ideas. And But David, the, uh, I guess the answer I would say is that every one of these airlines that are purchasing billions of dollars worth of airplane. They're, I mean, they're committing their companies to the, these purchases. They have faith in the recertification process that we just talked about and that is apparently seriously flawed. And they purchase these planes and then they're kind of committed to it, you know? And so they're, I think there's an understandable reluctance to want to speak up. I think the airline pilots associations are probably also reluctant to speak up because, you know, from their vantage point, they heard about MCAS and, and they asked for the pilot training and now those things have been addressed. So they, they can't really, you know, what are they going to complain about, right? And that's why I think this information about these reports, you know, a small, seemingly a small number are, are significant. And so I think that anybody that has max airplanes in their inventory, any of those airlines, then passengers should should ask and say, what are you doing about this? I don't, I, you know, I don't want to hear about the millions of miles flown and the hundreds of thousands of departures. I want to talk about any of these planes having problems. Also, you know, the Boeing is discounting heavily these planes, David, in order to get them up in the air. So they're giving big discounts to the airlines. And I'm sure they're basically saying, you know, we're giving you a big discount. Keep your thoughts to yourself and just communicate it to us, not to your pilots union or to the public or to the FAA or to Congress. And how much media coverage you get? For example, there are five major documentaries on the Boeing 737 crash. Frontline, ABC, NBC, CBS, Rory Kennedy just finished one. It was at an event in Utah, the annual documentary event there. Did you get interviewed on any of those? You know, Ralph, the documentaries, I actually was contacted. Unfortunately, I was unable to participate in them at the time. And I regret that. I really, I regret it to this day. That was something that I wish I had done I can't disclose that why right now. Do you have official whistleblower status under federal law? I believe I do. I never stopped to look. I just wanted to get the information out there. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons that might explain what you just said. I'm yeah. going to round robin the, the 10 major reporters who've been covering the MAX, but they've been not covering it recently. So I'm going to notify all of them, the Post, Washington Post, New York Times. The best guy on this still is uh, Reuters, as you pointed out. He's the best guy. He really keeps an eye on it out of Texas. So my vantage point of this is, I don't know a better way of describing this, but it almost seems like it's been a sleight of hand, right? Like we all know that after the first crash, Boeing blamed the pilots and the airline. And then that didn't really get a lot of media attention. Second crash occurs. They try the same tactic. It blows up in their face because of the U.S. pilots, unions, et cetera. And they had to admit that the MCAS system was there because it obviously clearly played a role in the crash. And it was, in my opinion, it was, even though it was painful to, to have to acknowledge that, and they, they begrudgingly, I still don't know if they really truly acknowledged it, it was easier for, much easier for them to talk about a software fix and pilot training than to acknowledge yeah. that there's been widespread production problems affecting potentially hundreds of planes. And there's a, there's a term that we use in aviation. In, in the military, for example, we call it embedded, embedded hazard or a latent defect. You know, something that may not surface right now could potentially surface later. And so when you have these things starting to show up, especially early in their lifespan of these planes, you need to act with urgency. You can't just like say, oh, well, you know, these kinds of things happen and continue to downplay it because that's when, unfortunately, these tragedies hit. It's, you know, it could happen. That's right. 
Well, Boeing's greatest success was to divert attention from all these problems and focus on the MCAS. Yep. But that's going to change. That's going to change in part due to your work, too. So we'll be in touch, Ed. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Ed. By the way, you know, it's quite clear why the Justice Department and Buttigieg are acting this way. They don't want to shake up anymore the only aerospace manufacturer in the United States and a big exporter. They've had enough trauma out there in Seattle, so they don't want to, they don't want to open up that can of worms because basically Boeing is too big to prosecute. Yeah, Boeing is terrible. Boeing is terrible in all phases. This documentary I've been doing about nuclear power, they are the, they're the main villain there too, not cleaning up their mess. And they just have so much power, they can ignore laws. And they know it too. Yeah. It is fishy how the, the Congress has dropped the ball in the last year. You know, all that stuff Pearson's putting out, that's like a second wave that they've got to pay attention to. So we got to rev it up again, make the calls, 100 calls not returned, so we get a call returned. Yeah. Yeah. It's... He's very impressive. He's very impressive. Well, you very read that stuff, very yeah. meticulous. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 meticulous and it's scary in that it's not about the old problems. It's about the new problems that are manifesting because the they've obviously not changed their attitude toward production versus safety. Right. It's amazing uh, how it was all focused on the plane, not the not the factory. Yeah. I got well, away with it. Yeah. A couple of things that, you know, and I don't that we've talked about on the show that are kind of just not generally known. I just know from people that I know, is first of all the financialization of Boeing. And how that becomes paramount over the engineering. Yeah. And yet, well, we've made that point in prior programs. That's what I'm saying. Months. That's that's the only reason I know it. And the fact that that it's other things other than MCAS and the sensors. It's right. a whole culture that is just spitting out planes and not caring. They keep saying, look at all the millions of flights and so on and so forth. But they don't get one free crash. They don't get another free crash. Right. That's the whole point. Right, you know, exactly. Talking like, and they should know that because that could really do them in. So as so long as nobody goes to jail, what do they got to worry about? The worst that can happen to them is they're forced out with a huge severance pay. Yeah, that's the worst. And that's that's the problem. There's no skin in the game, as our friend Tlaib would say. And Mullenberg is now starting a company dealing with autonomous tractors or something like that. <laughs> that's great i think i drove those one of those when i was a kid uh, i fell off the track on the lawn and all of a sudden it became autonomous yeah. <laughs> and now more from bruce fine if we wanted to enumerate all of the hypocrisies of the u.s you know in terms of our international standing we basically say we get to do what we want but you can't you know yeah and it, it's incredible that I'm hearing, you know, turn on NPR, on cable news, and we're hearing all about the potential war crimes of Vladimir Putin. And <laughs> I didn't hear any of this 20 years ago when we were invading Iraq. I mean, you know, they're weapons of mass destruction and there are all these excuses, but the talk of Americans and American officials committing war crimes seem non-existent. No, but you remember early on, you know, Trump said, I'm going to drop the mother of all bombs in Afghanistan. There was no military purpose whatsoever. I just want to drop the mother of all bombs, see how it works. I mean, that was a clear, open confession of a war crime. Yeah. David and Steve and Hannah, Jimmy, did you know about the Laos situation? Yes. I, well, I, I knew we were in Laos. I mean, I didn't know that there was 80 million tons of ordnance still there. Listen to this one. George Herbert Walker Bush when the dictator of Iraq was threatening Kuwait, tanks were rumbling toward Kuwait, and then they took it over, and we went in under George Herbert Walker Bush and pushed them out. Well, we then went and attacked all kinds of parts in Iraq infrastructure and knowingly put a bomb down a deep shaft where 600 Iraqis were trembling in a air raid shelter. It was like a pit down an air raid shelter. And they put the bombs down there and incinerated all of them. Wow. All civilians, wow. all civilian families, because we went way beyond driving them out of Kuwait. And that was not, no declaration of war either, by the way. No. Went yeah. along. And, and 20 years earlier, 
A dictator of Iraq rumbled toward Kuwait, and our government and the British government had a treaty with Kuwait, and they said to the dictator, don't make a move through that border because we're going to send paratroopers. And he went back with his tanks to Baghdad. Why didn't we do that under George Herbert Walker Bush? We could have told Saddam, you cross that border, you know what's going to happen. We didn't do it because we really wanted to topple them. And it was all about oil. But that's a, a memory in Iraq, that shaft, that air bombing shelter. Just imagine the scene, right? They were all huddled underground and there was an open air shaft and we put bombs right there. Yeah. You don't think people like Putin know all that? That's why they think they can get away with this. But he's making a mistake. Eastern Europe is different from Middle Easterners. I just have a quick question for Bruce. The Biden administration says they're building a case to bring to the International Criminal Court against Vladimir Putin. Is America a signatory to the ICC? And can we bring a case to the no, um, ICC? Well, the legal situation is as follows. No, we're not a signatory, but there's jurisdiction. The ICC has jurisdiction over war crimes that allegedly occurred in a, a jurisdiction that what is a signatory. In Ukraine, we're alleging that the war crimes occurred in Ukraine. Obviously, the investigation is undertaken by the International Criminal Court itself, not the United States. But actually, anybody, even you or me, could make a complaint. It's up still, but for jurisdiction to attach, it has to be in a nation which has consented to the jurisdiction of the ICC by being a signatory or otherwise. Ukraine has, and that's why they would have jurisdiction here. Russia belongs, but we don't, right? We do not belong. I don't think Russia belongs, no. Russia is not a signatory. No. Neither is China. No. It's the same deal. You know, the only, the only reason why we have a nuclear non-proliferation treaty is because we exempted all the big powers and say we can keep the nukes. You know, it wasn't going to happen otherwise. And in fact, and that's, I mean, the ICC shows that. No way. The big powers never going to agree to subject themselves to the rule of law. They won't do it. You know, even when we initially had a monopoly of nukes, we went to the UN and we wanted to amend the charter to say, OK, we'll entrust the nuclear monopoly to an international body. But Russia has to lose its veto power in the Security Council. Russia said, no way, not no way. We don't trust anybody else. The whole thing went to the bottom of the deep blue sea. But that's the big powers are never going to agree ever to subject itself to the rule of law. And that's a wrap. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Until next time. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long.